So I'm going to start uh, this afternoon session. I'm Lainey Ross, for those who don't remember me or were here before I arrived uh, 23 years ago. Uh, I always thought I needed a passport to live in Chicago, Mark, so I don't have to move anywhere. Uh, but anyway, the, the session this afternoon is on transplantation ethics, and part of the reason for that is that this is the 50th anniversary not only of Henry Beecher's ethics and clinical research, which has been celebrated this whole year, but actually in March of 1966, there was a SEBA Foundation meeting in London. Uh, it was an international meeting, as I'll be talking about, and uh, it was the first meeting on ethics and transplantation. Think about it, only about 500 transplants had actually been done at at the time, and already they were worrying about all the ethical and policy uh, controversies that were arising from living donor as well as deceased donor transplantation. So that's what my talk's going to be about, and then we're going to talk about lots of other ethical and policy issues in transplantation for the first session of this afternoon. So let me begin with my talk. Um, anybody who wants to read a bio, you can get it from. Uh, the students over here. So 50 years ago, as I said, the SIBA Foundation had this meeting, and I want to look at their ethical issues. So in 1966, at this meeting, the main ethical and legal issues that were raised with regards to deceased donor kidney transplantation focused on, quote, how to define death. And one of the surgeons from Edinburgh, uh, Dr. Woodruff, commented that we really need a conference of a slightly different composition to consider this business of what is death. And actually, that conference takes place two years later. So two years from now, at the 30th McLean uh, conference, we could actually talk about that very important article, the ad hoc committee of the Harvard Medical School, when they wrote the uh, paper, A Definition of Irreversible Coma. But that wasn't going to be what this meeting was focused on. They didn't have the right people there. Um, instead, what they were worried about with regards to death versus dying was that there were lack of rules regarding the timing of when to procure organs. Right? So now when we declare someone dead, if we do it by circulatory, there's a question of how long do you have to wait type of thing. Those questions weren't yet being raised. And so the whole question of could you take organs from dying but not dead individuals was still up for grabs. And actually, Dr. Guy Alexandre from Belgium described the practice of removing kidneys from imminently dying patients. He approved of the process, and this is what he said in the SIBA meeting. He wrote, in our nine cases, we switched off the respirator immediately after the kidneys were removed. The heartbeats of all the patients cease within two to three minutes. In my opinion, it is irrelevant whether a heart-lung preparation goes on for two days or even for weeks. It's still a heart-lung preparation, and for us, it is still a dead person. In contrast, Keith Reemsma, a, a surgeon from New Orleans, he argued against taking organs from people who were dying and not yet declared dead, and this is what he stated. At present, it would not be acceptable in many countries to remove vital organs from living persons prior to what we now accept as death. We would do better to use our energies to make available the tissues of recently dead people. This is going to be our major source in the near future. And as we all know, Greensmith's position prevails, and today organs are only procured after the donor is declared dead, which is colloquially known as the dead donor rule. And although it prevails globally, they're actually it's being challenged on both sides. Some view it as too permissive um, because they don't agree that we're actually, when we use whole brain criteria, that we're actually not testing for all brain functions. And some view it as too stringent and want to argue that um, it really is irrelevant whether you have a corneal reflex to be declared dead and things of that sort. So, but Reinsma's prediction that deceased donor kidney transplant would be the main source of kidneys actually holds globally with some exceptions, and so again he was right. Um, but yet there is no international consensus, it wasn't then and it still isn't, on how to define brain death, let alone how to measure it. And there's no consensus, as I've mentioned, on the appropriate time interval after cardiocirculatory death. The conference mainly focused on living donor kidney transplant, and part of the reason for that was that was where really most of the success was happening. And here were the seven issues that they raised. And these are the seven issues that I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. So looking at the first point, is it ethical to maim an individual for the benefit of another? And I chose this language because that's the language that was used at the SIBA uh, conference. So, the, and the answer was twofold. One is it could be ethical to maim an individual with consent. And the second point was, and this is a very important one, they viewed living donor kidney transplant as a temporary solution. 
So with regards to consent, Joseph Murray, the surgeon from Boston who had performed the first successful living donor kidney transplant between identical twins in 1956, he acknowledged, we make a basic qualitative shift in our aims when we risk the health of a well person no matter how pure our motives. But because of this shift, he and others place great emphasis that the donor give a voluntary and informed consent. But he's also known because he basically said um, and warned about doing surgery on healthy people for the benefit of other people. And he said all clinicians working with kidney transplantation should strive for better deceased donor organ procurement so that the day will come when even the identical twin will not require a living donor. Boy, has that changed. In 2016, there's much greater accepting of living donation. We now view it as a long-term solution. We've moved from identical twins to extended family, to friends, to strangers. We've moved from directed donation, where I give directly to a family member, to being involved in paired exchanges and chains. We've moved from living ki donor kidney transplant as a possible solution to really the preferred option, including now, as we talk about it, there are uh, programs like donor champions coaching individuals on how to ask and encouraging the use of social media to find people who might be willing to donate your organs, some of which may have some ethical um, controversies with using it. So how then do, would Murray and, and how today would we ensure that consent is voluntary and informed? So back, as I said, in 66, this was a major concern. And so, for example, Woodruff in Edinburgh said they never accept a yes at our first discussion. I think that approach provides adequate safeguards against coercion. So they basically were saying that if they gave the information and they, and they sought out consent, you couldn't just say yes doesn't mean yes. You had to say yes, yes, in order to be a living donor. Ambourge, a surgeon in Paris, um, had a psychiatrist join the transplant team to determine whether the desire of the donor is stable, well-balanced, and rationally motivated, and then to also uncover any possible pressure coming from the other members of the family. So really very, very concerned that people were acting voluntarily and free of coercion. In 2016, we've formalized it. We now require living donor advocates and social work evaluations for all living donors broadly adopted to evaluate whether there is undue pressure or inducements and to determine that consent is informed and voluntary. Some programs require psychiatric um, involvement as well. Others only use that uh, depending on the potential donor. But the concern now becomes really magnified because as we've moved away from direct donations to allowing chains and exchanges, we've taken away one of the main reasons why individuals were rejected in, in earlier years, which was an ABO incompatibility. Now, it used to be when you would go in and you would get tested, if you were ABO incompatible, you were basically told you're, you're not um, eligible to be a donor and that was it. And while some people were disappointed, there were some people who were probably quite relieved. Now no one gets that medical excuse in that sense. I mean, we can talk about whether doctors should be giving out medical excuses, but now there is no longer that excuse because even if you can't donate directly to your sister, you can get involved in a chain or an exchange. The identical twin is an interesting one. Remember Murray's quote that um, he's looking forward to the day when even the identical twin won't be asked. Because back in 1966, we really didn't have any immunosuppression other than steroids. And so basically, it was only the identical twins where we had really good long-term outcomes. And so this concern of, the, of what role the identical twin should play, Sir Robert Platt, a British physician, explains. It's the only situation in which the operation is really likely to be a lasting success. Secondly, there is, as it has been said, only one donor. In other words, it's not like we can go to the whole family. It's only the identical twin who is really the eligible individual to donate. And so the onus or pressure is much on him. Thirdly, identical twins often have a great, very great understanding between each other, which might make the volunteering more easy or more difficult. So a lot of concerns about the, the potential coercive nature of being an identical twin. There was also a concern expressed in 1966 was whether the identical twin may actually be at increased risk of developing end-stage renal disease themselves, right? Because to whatever extent this is genetic, um, they have the same genes as the donor does as the recipient. 
And what's interesting is that in 2016, we still don't have evidence about whether an identical twin is at increased risk of developing end-stage renal disease if his or her twin has end-stage renal disease. And we don't know if this risk might be increased by doing the nephrectomy. Is that sort of the double hit hypothesis? Um, and part of the reason the evidence is lacking is because we don't keep a uh, universal registry. Right now in the U.S., we now are mandated to follow up for two years. Uh, we only started doing any follow-up in the late 1990s. And so we really don't have the data in part because we've never looked. The next issue was the issue of minors as donors. And here, there was a lot of controversy back in 1966. So should individuals who are under the age of 18 or 21 in most locations in 1966 be allowed to be living donors? And against it was a French surgeon who based, as well as a British legal scholar, David Dalby, who wrote, children should on no account be donors. And there should be no cheating by maintaining, for example, that the child would suffer a trauma if he were not allowed to give his twin a kidney or whatever it might be. The likelihood of a trauma incidentally will be greatly lessened if the law leaves not the shadow of a doubt that a transplant is here out of the question. The case will then be no different from where a twin dies from pneumonia, bad enough but with no scope for offer of a sacrifice, disappointment, or self-torture. In contrast, Murray uh, was willing to allow twins as young as 12 or 13, as well as argued in favor of allowing adolescent identical twins because of both the high likelihood of success and because, as Dalby predicted, the trauma if the healthy one did not offer a kidney at the age of 15, say. In 2016, the guidelines vary. An international systematic review found that 27 of 39 guidelines endorse an absolute prohibition of living kidney donation by minors. But 12 guidelines allowed it under certain conditions. So for example, would exceptionally allow living kidney donation by minors, provided that adequate safeguards are put in place, including an assessment of the minor's autonomy and maturity, authorization by an independent body, like a living donor advocate program, assuring that the anticipated psychosocial benefits outweigh the medical and psychosocial risks for the donor, and the restriction to situations of last resort. Um, the, the data from UNOS sh shows that twins have actually served as living donors, although it is rather uh, uncommon here in the United States. The next issue was health risks. So back in 1966, while some attendees worried about whether living twin donors were at increased risk, most weren't concerned about a, the risks of taking out a kidney. So Goodwin, a urologist from California, was adamant that, quote, the removal of a kidney has been described as a terrible thing, but it's not so serious as it has been made out in the conference. And Woodruff from Edinburgh claimed to be without a kidney in most cases is no disability. Certainly much less, for example, than being without a big toe if the other kidney is all right. Although he did then concede later on in the program that there was a small perioperative risk. And boy, has that changed recently. Um, while then, at that time, no other health risks were discussed, in 2016, in the last five years, there have been numerous papers that have come out to show one, what we already know about the perioperative risk, but now we're aware of some long-term risks, including an increased risk of developing end-stage renal disease, pregnancy complications in women who have been donors, and cardiovascular problems such as hypertension. As I've already mentioned, though, no data about identical twins and what the risk of a unilateral nephrectomy. And so one of my main points is we really need a systematic global long-term follow-up uh, program in order to really understand what we're asking of people when they ask them to serve as a living donor. My last slide will be about the economics. And here there were, there were really two issues that were raised at the SEBA meeting. One was about the barriers, the financial barriers, but also the ethics of, uh, of an organ market. So with regards to the economic barriers, they talked about both insurance and out-of-pocket expenses in 1966. And with regard to insurance, Murray cited data that insurance companies would not discriminate against donors. He called a couple of insurance companies and they said if they're found healthy, then it wouldn't matter whether they had one or two kidneys. In 1966, the out-of-pocket expenses, Schreiner, an internist in Washington, D.C., stated, somebody going in for his own medical care might be willing to handle these out-of-pocket expenses, but the volunteer has gone further. In a sense, we have a higher obligation to him. And in fact, in, in Britain, people like Brotherston raised the issue of paying for the consequences to the donor of giving the organ. They may have heavy travel charges, he may suffer loss of earnings, and there may be other financial implications. 
So again, 50 years ago, they understood these issues. Today, there's some data to suggest that donors do have difficulty getting insurance. Whether this persists with Obamacare has not been studied, and of course, whether Obamacare remains, we also don't know. Um, in 2016, out of expense, out of pocket expenses, the study showed to be quite significant, and there is broad support for removing these financial obstacles to living donation. But uniform and universal methods to cover these expenses have not been established. The issue of markets, just given the limited time, I'm just going to say that there's broad, albeit non-universal, consensus against organ markets both then and now. So to conclude, 50 years ago, organ transplant has become well established throughout the world. However, many of the concerns raised at the SEBA symposium remain highly relevant and arguments similar to those made by the attendees continue to be part of the current debates. These debates have helped to shape the current ethical boundaries of organ transplant. Reesma summed it up nicely. He wrote, the experience cited at this meeting illustrates that medical science has influenced ethics just as ethics has influenced medical science. In the next 50 years, the ethical considerations must not lag behind the scientific advances in transplant, but instead must keep pace with, if not proactively predict them. This will best be achieved by transparency and innovative developments and the inclusion and engagement of individuals from a broad range of disciplines in designing research protocols and developing policy and practice guidelines. Thank you very much. I've left myself five minutes for questions, please. Very interesting. Uh, I, I envy going through those papers. It must have been fa fascinating. In 1966, even more than today, it would have been unusual for people from a variety of different cultures to get together in one room, obviously pre-Skype, that kind of thing. I'm curious, when you looked through the notes, I mean, obviously, medicine in general is social and contextual, and particularly organ transplantation, and particularly the words that are tossed around, words like consent and minor and that sort of thing. Do you see national styles? Do you see people behaving differently from different social contexts? Or do you see a desire to act as though everybody means the same thing when they use those words? So it's less archival than you had hoped. They actually oh. published the symposium into a book that's actually now available online. So I'm not actually looking at the original um, information. So this is what has been already cleaned up type of thing. Uh, what's interesting, you say, you know, a diverse group of people in the audience, uh, it was all male. It was all white. It was from the US and Europe, but from nowhere else. So um, not as diverse as we would hope in 2016 when the conversation comes. It also included you know, doctors and one theologian, one journalist, and lawyers, but there were no philosophers, religious ethicists, patients, uh, either recipients or donors, and, and things of that sort. Hi, Lainey. Hi, Mike. Uh, Shapiro Rutgers. Um, Lainey, you, you know, obviously there's been a great deal of, quote, progress, unquote, in the science of transplantation in the last 50 years. You've shown us the difference uh, in some of the ethical policies. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on whether you think that's progress or not. Um, well, so again, I think that the answer to that is partially contextual in that, um, so I do think the science is changing, and as the science changes, we sometimes have to rethink where our ethics are. I think some of the debates, though, are, are really um, are pointing out where our science is missing, right? I mean, the fact that we don't know 50 years later whether we're putting identical twins at greater risk than other people is really shameful. And the fact that it took us 50 years to understand about some of the risks of increased risk of renal disease and heart disease was because, so there's a famous book called The Gift of Life, which was written by Simmons and Simmons. Um, he was a transplant surgeon, she was a social worker, and it's divided into three parts. It was divided into donors, non-donors, and patients. So the recipients of organs were considered patients, but the donors weren't. And I think that's been one of our biggest scientific m misses in the whole field, was that we haven't considered until very recently the living donor as a patient, which is shocking, because you're taking this person to the operating room. Um, and yet, 
So I think that the science actually um, has missed the opportunity to, to allow the ethics to go along with it. Okay, well thank you very much.